We are at our last lecture in learning objective two, state pattern, uh, reinforcing the state pattern. We already talked about everything of what the state pattern is on Wednesday. Uh, Today is an example with a memory diagram, so we can actually see it in action and visualize how this uh, this thing is actually working. So after that, we're done with LO2 content. Uh, you'll have you right now have everything that you need to finish all of project two. All of point of sale. Uh, uh, today's the last day of content to talk about task three stuff and the application objective you should be able to do with the knowledge you have, or at least with the knowledge that's been covered in lecture. Uh, so after today, project two is in all of your hands. It's kind of out of my hands. Uh, starting Monday, I'll be talking about project three stuff. Uh, so, um, so that's where we're at with content. Starting on Monday, we're going to be talking about first class functions. Oh, concurrency, get out of there. I did update this, got rid of that concurrency. Um, so starting on Monday, by Monday, I'll release project three as well, and we'll start talking about project three stuff. Functions, recursion, immutability, uh, the new topics we'll talk about there. So any course level questions before we jump into things? Yeah. Specific to object-oriented programming? Uh, kind of. Uh, so the question is, is the state pattern specific to object-oriented programming? Uh, kind of. Uh, you could do the same thing with functional programming, though, by swapping out functions instead of objects. You could get the same behavior. Uh, but we will talk about it under the umbrella of OOP because it, it fits better with the OOP model. Uh, it, it gives us more flexibility. It'd be pretty tough to do exactly what we're doing here with functional programming, but it could be done. The idea can still apply. In the, the comment in chat, it was made half an hour before this lecture, but it only gets worse <laughs> is uh, uh, accurate. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. I know it has, uh, I know none of you asked about this, but um, uh, the questions have been really hard recently, and it only gets worse. This is kind of, so let me back up a bit and talk about the difficulty curve of this course. The intended difficulty curve, uh, and what I like to go for in, in all of my courses, is that the intro, like quarter of the course, isn't too bad. It's uh, uh, getting our feet wet, getting used to the structure of the course, how things are going to roll. It's kind of your tutorial of this is what 116 is going to be like, uh, the, or any of my courses. The middle half, so LO2 and LO3, that's the core of the difficulty. So from LO1, there should be a big difficulty spike to LO2, and that should be fairly constant for LO3, if not a little bit down, just because you're getting better, but the course isn't getting harder for LO3. Uh, the course kind of hits its uh, peak difficulty right from LO2, which of course you're all feeling uh, right now. And then for LO4, the difficulty should go down a little bit. Not as easy as LO1, but it should be the, that last quarter of the course should be a little easier than the middle half, uh, but a little harder than the first quarter, uh, if that makes sense, if I'm explaining that right. So the difficulty curve should be pretty low, then spike up, plateau a bit, and then dip down a little bit at the end of the semester. Uh, and the reason for that, I like having it dip down and get a little easier at the end, because at that point, we're all exhausted. You're getting your asses kicked by projects and uh, final exams and other courses. That's when everyone is demanding your time. Uh, so I like to back off a little bit. I like to do things a little, little opposite. Um, back off a little bit at that point and let you focus on your other courses. As long as you've been keeping up and doing well in 116, I'll back off in the, that last quarter. Uh, the two, last two weeks of the schedule are just open-ended review, for example. Like there's not even anything I'm asking you to do except the labs at that point. Um, <clears throat> But the middle half, like that's where, I mean, yes, you have midterms this upcoming week uh, and this week, so that kind of messes things up a bit. But the middle half, uh, that's where I'm demanding your attention the most, is the middle half. If you make it through LO1, or if you make it through LO2, I often say this, and the, the numbers back this up, if you make it through LO2, if you survive LO2, even if you're on your, your last breath at the end of LO2, if you survive LO2, you're going to be well, you're going to be passing this class, you're going to do good. Uh, this is the crux of it. If you can get through task three of project two, you are definitely capable of passing this class with that same level of effort, I'll say. Uh, I should hedge a little bit, maybe not definitely, but almost certainly you're going to be good for the rest of the course. Uh, which uh, I, I like to take timeouts and say this every once in a while because 
uh, it's easy to think, okay, LO1 was here, LO2 is here, that means LO3 is gonna be here and LO4 is gonna be up there. Uh, that's not necessarily how, it, how it's gonna roll. That's not how the course difficulty curve is designed. Uh, if you can make it through LO2, you should be good for the rest of the semester. Yeah. All right, is, is LO4 easier because of what you're assigning or is it easier because of what we know? It's, uh, LO4 is easier because of the content. Um, it's not like mind-blowing, it's not mind-blowingly different content in LO4. Um, it is, I think it's objectively easier than LO2 and LO3. Uh, and you're better, so it feels even easier because of that. Um, but like introducing OOP, OOP is like a whole different way of thinking, completely different way of thinking and a different way of approaching programming. So that's hard to learn at first. It's very hard, and I, I understand that. Uh, and then we're going to shift gears on Monday. We're going to do a hard shift over to functional programming, which is another completely new way of looking at things, completely new way of approaching programming. Uh, that's going to be another hard shift. Uh, about as hard as the start of OOP. Um, but then when we get to LO4, it's like taking everything you know and not learning anything new that like mind-blowingly different. We're just throwing some more data structures out there. You know what a list is, you know what a map is, uh, and then we're gonna explain linked lists in depth and then explain trees and graphs in depth. In depth. Um, and it's just not as uh, different of a way of thinking is LO2 and LO3. Uh, that said, we will use some LO2 and LO3 topics and concepts in LO4, so we will still be reinforcing that material. Uh, but you should, be, you should be really good at that stuff by the time you get to LO4, in theory at least. Like we'll have an object with a method that takes a first class function, we'll do things like that. This slide, I was about to update this and then I looked at the clock, it was already four o'clock, but we're not, or three o'clock. Uh, it's not jumper example. It's hopefully the only typo I have in these slides, uh, but right on the title slide. <laughs> at this point, I'd feel bad if I didn't have a typo. <laughs> Should we expect state diagram, memory diagrams on the next quiz? No, 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 no. Uh, so state diagrams are not technically a topic of the course. State, di uh, state diagrams and the state pattern are used to reinforce your understanding of inheritance and polymorphism. Inheritance and polymorphism will be on the quiz and you'll be sketching the memory diagrams for them, but they won't contain the state pattern. Uh, I, guess, I guess they could, like it, it wouldn't be a complete violation if they contain the state pattern. But you can follow the state pattern, you can trace through state pattern code if you understand inheritance and polymorphism and never heard of the state pattern before, you'd still be able to trace through that code. Um, but you won't be asked to write a state diagram. State, oh, state diagram, memory diagram. Those are two different things, but state diagram, no. Memory diagram, that on code that uses the state pattern, almost certainly no, but I haven't seen the quiz yet. Um, so if it is on there, then it's Paul's fault if he put it on there. And no for the interview as well. Uh, state pattern won't be on the interview as well. Is it? That's not on the interview, right? Is the interview form out? But not exactly. I'm not going to ask them to describe the state pattern, but if they can explain the concepts using the state pattern, that's fine, I think. Yeah, okay. Just to make sure we're all on the same page there. Yeah, so, so there won't be any questions on the interview about the state pattern, but if you use the state pattern in your answer to explain the questions, to explain your answers, then that can help you. I like that answer. Uh, but nowhere on the interview will, will your TA be like, what's the state pattern? If they do, email me, let me know, and I'll be like, that's not fair, and make sure I adjust your grades accordingly. They shouldn't be asking about the state pattern. Does quiz three have code tracing? Yeah, yeah, all the quizzes are gonna be memory diagrams. That's why we're showing so many memory diagrams in lecture. The, uh, all four quizzes are going to be memory diagrams. We find more examples of inheritance memory diagrams on the updated reference sheet uh, on this guy. It's so messy. 
Uh, there, there's this one, there's the state pattern one, which applies inheritance and polymorphism. I believe this is just updated yesterday. Uh, so if you haven't seen that one yet, we do have an extra one on there. Yeah, no problem. No problem uh, table flip, I guess I'll call you. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce that. All right, so this is what we want to do today. I got one example. We're going to talk about this example the entire lecture. So what we want to do today is build a TV, or simulate a TV, I guess, in software. I want these features on my TV. And we're going to have this API. The API is going to be given to us. Uh, very similar to the homework. So this was an old lecture question, back when lecture questions were programming assignments. The, instead of project tasks, we had lecture questions, which were programming assignments, and they became lecture tasks. It doesn't matter. Uh, but this used to be uh, an assignment that you would have to complete. So you would have a TV class that would have these five methods, just like you have your self-checkout class, which has the button press methods. And this would simulate a remote control where you have a volume up button, a volume down button, a mute button, and a power button, a four button remote control. And then one method current volume, which is going to return an integer, which is our way of testing this thing to see if it's returning what it's supposed to be returning. So very similar to self-checkout where you have all the button methods. And then two methods, uh, display string and items in cart, which you're calling to test the functionality to make sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, same thing here except a little bit simpler example so we can cover it in a lecture and, and uh, talk about it. I'm only going to show a partial solution to this on the slides, but the whole solution is in the repo. If you go to LO2 states and TV, I think is the package name, uh, you'll find all the TV code with the state pattern applied. And there's also a test suite in there in the test package that tests the TV. And you can see the usage. You can get a good example of how to test uh, with, your LO, uh, with your task three. Uh, and I should mention, just because I've said this in several lectures, so those of you really paying attention, um, I'm not going to show test cases for test three today. Uh, the testing, I was looking at it and I was going to, uh, but the testing is the same way as we test test two and test one. It's the same thing, I'd just be showing the, showing the same thing over again. Um, on the testing side, testing test one is just the same difficulty as testing test three, but you have more features, you have more tests, there'll be more code with the test. But you're doing the same thing. You're pressing the buttons. You're checking display string. You're checking items in cart and making sure all the right stuff is there. You're just testing different features. So for example, task three, you'll press enter. You'll press the buttons for a barcode and press enter twice, for example, to test the uh, enter rescans items. Uh, and taking up like half of lecture to show you that, just press enter twice. Uh, uh, not much. It's the code that gets a lot more complex with task three. And I'm not going to show you the solutions to the code. Uh, I kind of am because the lecture examples are made to somewhat parallel the homework. Uh, did everyone catch that on, on Wednesday, by the way? The, uh, uh, on, no, Monday? Uh, the add, oh, crap, I, I don't remember the example. The uh, add uh, uh, pickup, that's what it was. Uh, the character picking up items, you pick up uh, a game object. It's kind of like adding a modifier to an item. And then you uh, calculate the weight of all of the items in the inventory. That's like computing subtotal or tax. Uh, you're iterating through those things. Or, or uh, just the price and tax of an, a single item. Uh, you're iterating through all those things. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too subtle, uh, that you were able to help uh, get help with task two on that one. Uh, so this is what we want to do. Hopefully we've had a little bit of time to, to look at this, all this text. Uh, we have this API, these four buttons, and then current volume, which we can call to make sure that the volume is the same. It's the only way we're testing this TV. We're not testing the image that's displayed or anything. We're just making sure the volume is what we expect it to be. And of course, we're not going to use any control flow. This would be a no conditional <laughs> assignment and having to use the state pattern. So what, does this, what is this TV supposed to do? I don't know if I want to just read through all of these, but the big thing is tracking what the volume should do at any given time. So initially, the volume, the TV is off, 
but the volume internally is set to five. But since the TV is off, current volume should return zero. If we turn the TV on and off, when it's on, the volume should be five and current volume should return five. We turn it off again, volume should be zero again. When the TV's off, the volume up and down buttons don't do anything. But when the TV's on, the volume up and volume down will adjust the volume within a range, a minimum volume of one and a maximum volume of 10. There's also a mute button, which we're not gonna sh see in the example, but a mute button. When the TV's muted, current volume should return zero. And then when you press either mute, volume up, or volume down, that will unmute the TV, but not change the volume. So volume up only unmutes, does not increase the volume at that time. Uh, and then finally, if you turn the TV off and back on, it should resume the volume where it was. So if I turn the TV on, hit volume up, volume up, my volume should be seven. Turn the TV off, turn the TV back on, volume should still be seven. So that should be preserved. So somewhere in that TV, it needs to remember that it's volume seven. So basically a lot of how the TV uh, should behave. Just like the self-checkout, like how would we expect that to behave in the real world? Uh, this is how I would expect a TV if I, I'd be mad because I only had four buttons. Uh, but this is how we would expect that TV's volume to be controlled. So a lot of different behavior depending on states, of course. So how would we design for this? Oh, thanks for the link, Nicholas. That's convenient. So we could do this with conditionals, of course. You could write all this code, get all this functionality with conditionals, have a bunch of if statements and you know whatever. Um, but that would be more of a, a 115 thing, not necessarily because it's easy, but because it's only applying 115 concepts. Like it'd be a good exercise there, um, showing you how to get all this functionality. Maybe a little too involved for 115. But we're here to learn about the state pattern, so let's use the state pattern. Even though for this specific application, state pattern might not be the best solution. We probably should just use conditionals for this one. But I, uh, state pattern really kicks in when the examples are large. And again, large examples I can't cover in 50 minutes in slides. Um, so let's do this. This is the slide, the last slide from Wednesday that I skipped over. I didn't bother talking about it at all because I knew I was going to talk about it all lecture today or half a lecture today anyway, is how are we going to apply the state pattern? And I like to do it in three separate steps. We're going to take three steps. We're going to first write our API. What are all of the methods that we're going to defer to our state for functionality? So this is any function that can be called on my main object, TV in this case, or self-checkout on the homework. What methods can be called that are ever going to do something different in any situation? If the method should ever have different behavior, then I want to defer to my state and let the state control that behavior, and the behavior is going to change based on state transitions. So write my API for this one and for self-checkout. The API is already given to you, uh, mostly because those are the methods that we have to call to test. Like I, We have to call those methods in Autolab. You have to call those methods in your test. So we kind of have to give away the API. Uh, so the API is done for us. It's the four buttons and the current volume method. So next, where we should start uh, on the homework and for this one is decide what states we should have, what different states can this object be in, what different scenarios cause a different set of behavior, behaviors. Even if one of the API methods should do something different, that's a state transition. You have a state transition at that point. And then finally, determine where are your state transitions, which method calls on which states are going to trigger transitions to other states. So let's pick apart this. So let's pick apart this uh, spec sheet and determine what functionality we have. And I kind of miss, to be honest, I miss these uh, style of questions where I just give you a spec sheet, build a software that has these features. Um, and then you have to pick apart all the feature lists. Um, I like that better than here's several pages of a homework document. Uh, maybe someday we'll bring these smaller questions back. But, um, so for the API, again, the API is given to you. It's these five methods. But if we didn't have that, if you were designing this purely on your own, we would look at this spec sheet and pick out all of them actions, all them verbs that can happen on our machine, uh, on, our, uh, uh, on our TV. So we're going to uh, 
um, ask for the volume. If initial volume is five, volume, like it's not a verb, but it's a bad example, uh, bad transition there. Uh, but volume up, volume down. When the volume goes up or down, the mute button is pressed. Up, down, pressed. Uh, the power button is pressed. The volume button is pressed. It's mostly just the buttons, but also any time we're asking for the volume. What is the current volume of this device? Those are going to be our API methods. What actions can be performed on this TV? And then the first thing we had to think about, what are the states? What different states can this be in? Where do we have st different sets of behavior for our API methods? The way I like to think of this is we start with our, let me go back to the API. To determine the states, we start with our API and we think we first start this program, we first create an object of this type, of type TV. What do all these buttons do immediately? So our TV is initially off, so my initial state, I'm already thinking it's going to be in an off state, and I'm going to decide what these five methods do in the off state. And I'm going to decide, okay, this is what all these things do. And then I'm going to look through my functionality here and say, is there ever a case where those, any of these five methods don't do those things? And of course, there, there's a couple here. Uh, when the TV is on, the volume, instead of returning zero, is going to return what the actual current volume of the TV is, which is initially five and then can change throughout the, uh, throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the program. So current volume is going to change after power is pressed. I know there's a change there, so I know that there's at least one other state. I at least have two states here, and I have two sets of behavior. And then I look, okay, when my TV's on, what does each button do? What does each a API method do? And I have a second set of behaviors. So I got two sets of behaviors for all my methods. Then I look at my spec sheet again. Is there another situation where any where the entire set of behavior of the TV does not match either of those two sets of behavior for those two states? If the answer is yes, which of course it is here, we're going to have another state. So we want to look through our spec sheet. So we want to look through our spec sheet and decide what the three, uh, not to completely give it away, uh, what the states are. So same with your self-checkout machine. When you first turn the thing on, what should it do? Well, it should do your task two, whatever it did in task two, that's, uh, that's your initial state. And then what buttons can you press? What happens? Is there any combinations of buttons you can press where any of the buttons do something different? Well, sure, once you scan an item, the enter button has different behavior after that. Once you hit the checkout button, everything has different behavior after that. So we're thinking, okay, those are different states that the machine can be in, because that's the only way you're going to change the behavior of a button is by changing the state of the object. So you had some time to think about it. For this one, I think it kind of jumps out at you. Um, I, I assume at least we have the off, the initial state. We can turn the, the TV on, but not muted. And then when we hit the mute button, we're in a mute state. Uh, when we're muted, the volume up, volume down, and mute buttons have different behavior. Uh, so that's going to be another state, a third state in this. And then no matter how hard we look at this spec sheet, we're never going to find a fourth state. We're never going to find a fourth set of behaviors of the API methods. Or we're confined to these three states. We don't need a fourth one. And if, we're, if we hit a, like in muted, we can hit mute, volume up, volume down. We're going to get a different set of behavior. But that set of behavior is going to be exactly the set of behavior in the on state. So we didn't actually create a brand new state. We just transitioned back to an existing state. So think about that in your self-checkout machine. If you transition and you create a new state and you have two states with identical behavior, you don't have two states that are just the same state. And then lastly, we think about our state transitions. We have our three states, our three sets of behavior. Now, how are we going to transition between these states? What actions can be taken to transition between these states? When I'm in each state, which API method calls are going to trigger a state transition or a change in behavior of the object? So I'll just jump right to the, the solution here. Uh, 
to go from the off state to the on state. That happens whenever we hit the power button. On to off, same thing, we hit the power button. When the power button is pressed, we're going to have those state transitions. From on to muted, every time the mute button is pressed, so in the on state, in its mute method, we're going to make sure to include a state transition. When that button is pressed, we're transitioning over to another state. Muted to on, this happens every time either mute, volume up, or volume down are pressed. So all three of those methods should have state transitions. And then muted to off, whenever the power button is pressed. And notably, there's no off to muted state transition. Uh, that's the one transition that's missing here. Because when the TV's turned off while muted and turned back on, it should not be muted anymore. We have that last feature at the end there. Um, we don't want, I don't know. Maybe somebody does, but I don't want that feature in my TV. If I'm muted and then I turn it off, uh, when I turn that TV back on, I want some volume, but I want to unmute it every time. I think that's how, I believe I tested this on my TV to make sure my TV behaved like this. Um, I, so there, there used to be, a, I used to have a microwave assignment for the state pattern. I spent hours just hitting buttons on my microwave to figure out uh, to figure out how it worked so I could accurately have the assignment accurately be at least how my microwave worked. Uh, it had power level functionality. We were playing with power level in the assignment. Uh, so all the edge cases, if you hit power level and then time cook and then hit numbers, what should it do? I spent way too long doing that. This one didn't take as long, but, uh, but I like accuracy. It, uh, I want you to be able to solve real world problems. Let's make them as real world accurate as possible. Anyway, uh, It'll be accurate to at least my devices at my house <coughs> and the self-checkout machines at Wegmans. Uh, so those are the state transitions. And once we finally get this, uh, get this going, this is what our state pattern, state diagram is going to look like. We are initially in the off state. Power transitions between on and off. No surprise there. Uh, muted power goes to off. And then our mute. Uh, mute and unmute functionality. So any questions on that? The, this, is my, this is like my recommended approach of how to tackle a state pattern question or more to the point, how to tackle task three of the homework. Uh, following these steps. API is done for you which states exist, how many states, what's the behavior in each state, and how do you transition between states? Any questions about that approach? <coughs> yeah. If you were gonna get rid of that last specification, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's gonna be that found it is still muted, mm -hmm. that would be like a very simple change, right? That kind of. So if I wanted to, the reason that, part of the reason why that's in there, um, would it be an easy change to get rid of that last bullet point? You would need another state to be able to do that because you would also have, you would not just have an off state, you would have an off muted state, which when power is pressed from off muted, you want to go to muted, and from this off, you want to go to on. Uh, so it would require an extra state. I was just trying to, partly trying to trim down the states, but I do believe that's how my TV works also. But uh, you would need a fourth state to do that because you have a different set of behavior. What now off the on the power button is going to do two different things based on uh, based on what's happened in the program, which tells us we need another state. All right. So like I said, the full solution is in the repo that satisfies all those specs, and there's a test suite which tests everything. Um, so if you want to see the full code and for those of you really thinking about it, if you want to see how I handle uh, min and max volume without conditionals, you can check that out too. Um, but here's the abbreviated program that we're going to look at today. So I can keep the font size big. I had that one example where the font size was so small. I feel bad about that one. Uh, so I can keep the font size big. I trimmed down as much as I could. And uh, this is legal syntax in Scala. I'm going to put my methods on one line. As long as the code is in between uh, the braces and I only have one line methods. Uh, actually, the braces are, are optional at this point, but I think that's just confusing to read. Um, but, uh, but this is our code. So I eliminated the mute state completely. We're just going to have power uh, on and off. 
We're going to have a uh, TV, an initial TV. We're going to hit volume up, check the volume. We're going to hit power button, which we would expect to be a state transition to the on state. We're going to hit volume up, which we expect to actually do something this time. This volume up while the TV's off shouldn't do anything. This one should be volume up, and then print out the current volume. So this is what we want to talk about. Who's ready for another state diagram? And I, I think the state diagrams, uh, I'll have to see when I generate the final versions of them all, but I think the state diagrams in LO3 will be a little simpler. Um, there's a there's one new thing we had to tackle of functions on the heap, but uh, uh, I think they'll they won't be as crowded as these ones. So it should be I'm hoping I'm optimistic that this will be the last really uh, really crowded example. All right, who's ready for this thing? Let's do it. All right, so very first thing, we've seen this plenty of times. TV, uh, call the constructor. The constructor doesn't have any parameters. When a constructor doesn't have parameters, the parentheses are optional here. So no state variables in there. So the constructor just has a reference to this, which is the TV that's being created. And then we're going to call all the code, run all the code that's outside of all the methods. And any variables that are declared outside of the methods that are ran with the constructor call are going to become state variables, and they are part of the object. So this val volume equals 5, that's part of the object. It becomes a state variable of the object. It does not go on the stack. It's going to go inside that object itself, and we have a volume of 5. That much we should be really comfortable with at this point. Uh, the next thing we actually haven't seen yet, I meant to do an example with this. Uh, this is what we call composition for what it's worth, where we have an object which is going to store a reference to another object. We say that these, uh, that's uh, composition relationship between the two classes. I'm never going to quiz you on that vocab, so don't worry about that. Um, but when an object has a reference to another object. So in the constructor call of TV, we're going to call the constructor of off. We're going to create a new object of type off. We're going to pass this, which is that reference 350, a reference to the TV, to the off constructor. And we're going to return that to the state variable named state of type TV state uh, of the TV. And, and I forgot to mention, uh, at this point, I'm dropping the arrows. I'm sick of seeing those arrows cluttering up my slides. I think it just confuses things. Uh, so all the references are color-coded and have numbers. So follow the numbers or follow the colors to see where those references point to. I'm going to drop the arrows. For your LO2 quiz next week, you should still draw the arrows just to make it abundantly clear that you know what you're doing. Don't give us uh, any reason to, to not give you credit on them. Um, but I'm going to drop them in lecture. Just because I think it's more confusing to look at. Uh, and. Uh, these lectures are confusing enough as it is. Anything we can do to make them better, I'm going to do. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to call the off constructor, which extends TV state. So we get the TV as a constructor parameter. All constructor parameters become state variables. So the constructor parameter is part of the object. And we're also going to call the TV state constructor. Technically, this TV shouldn't be there quite yet uh, until we call the TV state constructor. Add that stack frame to the stack. These are method calls. So right now, we have three stack frames on the stack that are, uh, that are running. Uh, technically, four, one for the main method, which we don't draw in our memory diagrams. Uh, and TV state is the only active stack frame. Uh, it's the only one that's currently, uh, currently running. So we have the TV state constructor. We have a constructor parameter of TV, which gets a reference from the TV. So to follow where that came from, new off took this. In this TV stack frame, this was 350. So we pass that 350 to off's constructor. So the TV was 350. That becomes a state variable because it's a constructor parameter. 
and then we call TV state with the TV. The TV is 350, so TV state gets TV value of 350, and that also becomes a state variable because it's a constructor parameter. Well, we have to draw the arrows the entire semester. Uh, I have to, I have to talk to Paul about it uh, to see what our final decision is. Uh, personally, I don't think I'd care if you didn't draw them on LO2, uh, but I have to talk about how we're going to grade just to make sure we're consistent in saying the same thing. Uh, I would, as if I'm a student in this class, I'm drawing the arrows on LO2 regardless, um, just because it can make things really clear. Because if I write one number wrong, if I accidentally write the wrong number, but I know what I'm trying to convey, um, that arrow can save my ass and save me from losing credit. I'm drawing the arrows no matter what if I'm a student. Uh, I recommend the same. Uh, but technically, would you potentially get credit without the arrows on LO2? Uh, maybe. Uh, Nicholas, do you know if Paul made any comments about that? Okay. Yeah, so, so I would draw them anyway. Yeah. Would everything still work if you uh, called all the parameters uh, TV instead of the TV and TV? And would all this work if you called, if this parameter was TV instead of the TV? Yeah. It would, it will still work, but it's just a little more confusing to read. Um, if this is called TV, I would not be able to put valor var right there. That would break things. But since I don't have valor var, then I would get away with putting that as TV. It would still work. Because uh, val makes this public. And then out here, if I say, uh, I guess I don't access it anywhere. Uh, but if I said dot TV, what am I, which TV am I going to get? So only one of them can be public. But if, if this is called TV, and I do this.tv right here, I'm going to get this TV, not this TV. So I would get this one and not this one. Now in this case, they both refer to the same object, so we get the same thing anyway. But it is something we need to think about and uh, be concerned about just in case things are out of sync. What's the point of? TV right here. Uh, so the TV is a variable of type TV. So this has to take a TV, and we did pass it a TV. So in this constructor, while well, TV is being created, oh, that's starting to lose meaning. Saying TV too much. Uh, we're going to pass a reference to a TV and satisfy that type. That's the type of the input. Uh, the state is going to need a reference to the object to which it's attached. The object that's deferring to that state for behavior, it needs a reference to that so it can pull off these state transitions. Oh, I can't reach them. But so it can pull off the state transitions where it needs a reference to the, to the object that it's defining the behavior for. It needs a reference to that so we can do the state transitions. <laughs> and for something like self-checkout, oh, actually we do it right here. And to access the other state variables of that object. So I need to control the volume of the TV from this state. I can only do that if I have a reference to the TV, um, technically this variable here. If I have a reference to the TV, then I can control the state variables. So like in your self-checkout machine, you're going to have states that are going to be adding items to carts. You're going to need access to the cart and the items that have been added to the store, your map that stores barcodes to items, you need access to both those data structures from inside your states. So if we have a reference to the self-checkout object, we can say, hey, self-checkout object, uh, let me access your data structures. We can only do that if we have a reference to that object that that state is attached to. All right. So Constructor returns, TV state re returns, off returns. Uh, another thing to keep these slides cleaner, I've been, uh, my last two memory diagrams, they come out really messy, so I've been working on this. Uh, instead of crossing these things out, I'm just going to gray them out like that. I think it's a lot cleaner on the slide. Again, for your quizzes, still draw your X's. You don't have access to uh, the, like transparencies and stuff that I have on the slides. Um, I guess if you had like a light shading with a pencil, I'd be fine with that. But. Whatever. Uh, it's, on your quiz, it's just easier to, to draw the X's. On the slides, to keep it cleaner, I'm going to make these transparent boxes. 
off returns, it returns a reference to the object that was created. <coughs> Store that in the state variable. So state was waiting for that constructor to return. It returns state gets that reference 200 to the off object that was created. And then the TV constructor returns. We got through all of the code that's not in any methods. Skip over all the methods. And that returns the reference to TV. All right, so most of that's uh, pretty, pretty review-y. Uh, we didn't have a constructor call from inside a constructor call that's not using inheritance, but I, I think that's, uh, I think you could have figured that, that one out by staring at it for a little bit. Um, but I wanted to make sure we went over it just in case. So now we're getting to the state pattern stuff. And looking at the time, how did, the, how did this time go? Uh, so we're gonna call volume up. And now volume up is going to defer to the state. The TV defers to its state for functionality. So we're not just going to handle, okay, what does the TV do in volume up? Volume up, the TV class itself, same with self-checkout, doesn't really control any of its own behavior. It just defers to its state for behavior. So this dot state, so this dot state dot volume up. So this is the current state object. And the type of this object is going to determine the behavior of the TV. The type is off, so we look at the off class for a volume up method. We look in the off class, we actually don't find one. So we're going to look at the inherited volume up method in the TV state. Uh, these methods are not abstract, they are fully defined, but they just don't happen to do anything. So we get to a method that doesn't do anything, volume up when the TV's off, shouldn't do anything. So we got the right thing there. It uh, doesn't do anything when we hit volume up. These methods return. And that call of volume up does nothing because we're in the off state. The off, the definition of volume up and off is just the default behavior of doing nothing from the TV state. We'll call current volume, do the same idea. Current volume, we defer to the state. This dot state dot current volume. So the type is off. And we go to current volume. This one is overridden. So we're going to use this current volume, which just returns zero. So when the TV is off, we're getting the behavior from the spec sheet that we want. The volume when the TV is off should be zero. It's not making any noise. It's not doing anything at all. And we print that to the screen, and then the stack frames return. So we're getting behavior depending on the type of the state object. Now let's hit TV power. This one, we're going to hit our first state transition. So we're going to call power, defer to the state, this, this, that state, that power, off. This in that stack frame is 200. So hit this power button. It is overridden in the off class. So we go right to off to find the behavior. We don't have to jump up to a super class to find the behavior. And we're going to call the on constructor with a reference to the TV. Somewhere in here. Here we are. Uh, with a reference to the TV. So we call the on constructor going to create a new object of type on and it's going to get as its the TV variable a reference which was this.tv in the off's power stack frame this.tv 350 so the TV is 350 just following our references on calls the TV state constructor, same thing we did when we created the new off class. And then this is going to return to the state of the TV. So we're going to say this.tv.state in this stack frame, this, oh, this.tv.state, that's what we're going to return to we're going to create a new on 
which is going to return to that variable. So we're going to update state to a reference to this new on state, this object of type on. And now we've just hit our first state transition. The state is no longer off. The state is now on. And we did that by changing the type of the reference, the type of the object being referred to by the state variable. We used to refer to an object of type off. We now refer to an object of type on. And now all of our behavior changes to the behavior defined in the on class. Now when we call power up, or uh, volume up, we're getting the behavior from the on class. TV.volumeUp, this.state.volumeUp, this.state.volumeUp. We found a, a class of type on. This is going to be 480, and the method is going to be this method from the on class. Now the button does something completely different. Without using any conditionals, we completely change the behavior of our program. Same exact method call. Completely different behavior because we hit a state transition and changed our behavior based on the type of an object, not any values with conditionals and saying if some conditional do something different. We changed the type of an object and then got completely different behavior. And now we're going to increase that volume. This dot TV dot volume increment by one. Very different behavior, same code from the main method. Same with current volume. We're now going to get the on class's current volume, which doesn't override current volume. So we look in the super class, current volume, this.tv.volume, this.tv.volume. We're going to get six and not just the hard-coded zero like we did in the off state. And notice if we turn this TV on and off uh, as many times as we want, this volume is still being preserved, whether we mute, turn the TV off or anything, it's still being preserved. And when we turn the TV back on or unmute it, we're still getting this volume, whatever it was changed to. It's still going to be six, even if we transition states again. But the state is going to say, I don't care what TV, uh, what the volume is, just return zero. We don't really have time for questions. I don't really have time for my state pattern closing. My, my big point is, um, Think about when to use the state pattern. Don't just, uh, if you do think, wow, this is really cool, don't just use it everywhere. Uh, think about when it's the, an appropriate situation to use the state pattern. Uh, and it's usually when you have an object with a lot of very differing sets of behavior. Uh, that's when the state pattern really shines. I hope the, uh, and, and of course, when you're done with the lecture question, you can go and have a great weekend and see you Monday. Uh, I hope this one's uh, obvious enough with the joke answer, but I would debate D. Uh, D's a little, mm, does it make your code easier to read? I don't know. I think it, I think it makes it harder in some aspects.